Welcome to the Smart Betting Club podcast. I'm your host, Peter Link. So in a change of format for this episode, instead of interviewing a guest, the topic of this podcast is the five stages of profitable betting and the journey from absolute beginner to long-term winner that punters can go on as we see it here at the Smart Betting Club. Now, this is not just some theoretical exercise either, as my guests and I live this out for real ourselves, make a nice income from many of the things we'll talk about today. So it's based on real life, skin in the game and experience. So let me introduce my two guests. First of all, I have Rowan Day, who many people will know from the Bet Diary blog. Rowan, welcome back to the podcast. How are you feeling post the Premier League season and Arsenal's bottle job? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought you might bring that up. Uh, <laughs> well, I was feeling as if I'd recovered from it, but you've just said that, that it's bringing it all the doom and gloom back to me now. So yeah, appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, I'm feeling good. I really enjoyed the season. Um, it was nice to have a bit of a distraction uh, for once with Arsenal doing so well. Um, so have a nice distraction from the better get times when things get a bit stressful. But no, all, all good, thank you. Is everything okay with you? Yeah, great with me. And I think both our teams are in the Premier League next season. Fixture list has come out. So uh, looking forward to um, the various challenges we'll both face. Yeah, I bet the come back actually would have been for me to ask you how Everton seasons went, really, wasn't it? But uh, yeah, never mind. Let's move on. Okay, move, moving on quickly. Uh, <laughs> uh, our second, second guest making this podcast debut today, we've got Josh Pollowitz. Josh, did I say your last name correctly? No, um, it's pronounced, oh. it's pronounced Pollowitz. So it's a Ukrainian name, uh, and yeah. So like Holloway, but with a P. Easy to remember, Ian Holloway, one of the uh, more entertaining Premier League Bounce managers of yesteryear. Yeah, Paul team was great to watch. It was, wasn't it? Yes, with... Uh... They were like the basball equivalent of football, I remember at the time. They'd have lots of 5-4 games. Yeah. Um, there was a game against Liverpool, I remember. It was crazy. They went Anfield. So they had like 10 pub players and then Charlie Adam, who was uh, quite good that year. Ended they were quite good because I was at the Emirates when Arsenal won 6-0 against them. If I remember rightly, Theo <laughs> Walcott got a hat-trick, so they can't have been that good. Well, Theo Walcott got a hat-trick against Croatia that time. Yes, away. I remember that too, actually. Yeah. World Cup finalist. Did he score one? At, I remember one against Newcastle as well. I think he scored one against them. Yes, in a seven-something win. Yeah, that was a good, a good Newcastle well, I like the way this podcast is going. <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal and Everton's Theo Walcott, I should hasten to add, and newly relegated. I think, and also free agent, yeah. perhaps. I think so. he's going to retire, from what I read. If Southampton went down, he was going to retire, if I've got that right. Wow. Yeah. He's been around a long time. He has. He's been around. So, Theo, if you're listening, we might have something for you to do today in your retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's talk about what we're going to go into today. Well, actually, before I get into this, we're going to record two podcasts on this topic. We're getting into the exact tips, as tools, and strategies to use. This one, we're not really going to get into the specific tips as we're going to use. And we're going to talk about more like the overarching strategies and things to be aware of and the five stages of the journey and what they look like. The members one that we'll record second, which you'll be able to download if you're a member behind the SBC member pay, we'll, we'll get into those specific tips. There's, um, so you can find out more if that is of interest to you and we'll give you a good outline and understanding. So we're going to go over the five stages of the journey today and it's fair to say each of us is at the perhaps more advanced scale but I don't want this to be off-putting for those listening who are new or perhaps feeling daunted by you know the fact that we're a bit more experienced because we all started somewhere. We all placed our first bet using a tipster or set up a betting bank to use one Guys, do you remember your first step or service you joined and the thoughts that went through your your mind at the time or what people thought about what you were doing? I was just thinking about this. It's just when you said that people may be feeling a bit daunted because one thing I do remember, and I'm going back a few years, obviously, but one thing I do remember is kind of thinking and that betting could potentially be a good way of making money, but being really scared to make that first step. and. I remember from my experience as, uh, as part of my misspent youth using tipsters, which looking back now were very obviously a complete scam. They'd advertise in, yeah. in the Racing Post and um, I can't remember what the, the other weekly publications were. Sporting Life Weekend, I suppose, would be one. And having been stunned by that, just thinking, yeah, perhaps it is a good investment, but really, can I actually do it? And I remember going to as it was then the Secret Betting Club's website, probably for weeks before I took the plunge. That is my very first memory. And then actually joining up was probably my first step towards betting seriously. How about you, Josh? 
Yeah, so I think mine came from, I was betting on American racing at the time, um, and I was using speed figures and like sectional timing um, with races like Gulfstream and places like that, uh, where it's a lot more prominent in America to bet that way. I think the first one I ever properly followed was on OLBG. So he was a specialist um, that concentrated on that type of racing. And then it kind of um, spread out from there. So obviously I'll be using sites like Odds Checker to get the best prices. And then you'd see the tipsters on there. And then once you're on Twitter and stuff, you just start to see different people and what they write, listening to podcasts, find judges that you kind of listen to and you thought, I like the way they come up with their bets or the process they go through. So um, yeah, finding similar voices, people who had the same kind of process. And then obviously, yeah, start to branch off into other sports. So horse racing to start with. And then I've kind of um, gone out into golf. It's a big part of my betting now. And then little bits of football here and there. So probably um, OLBG would have been my first um, guy on there. And then gone through a dozen since, like looking at different services, testing them out, paper trading them, and then finding the ones I like. So yeah, that's where I've got to the, I've got here. That's really interesting, isn't it? So I mean, we've got, on one hand, you've got Josh, who, I mean, you, when you're talking about things like sectional timings in, in US racing is, is one of your early sort of betting ventures. And then following experts of a like mind, et cetera, et cetera, whereas my expert was probably my best mate and our resource was a pint and a racing post. I imagine you had a lot more success than I did. And yet we've both got sure. to a point now where we're successfully following a load of tips and services. I think it shows the people who are listening here that it doesn't really matter what sort of background you have, if any, in gambling to make it successfully. Definitely. I mean, if you listen to something like, I think we've probably all listened to the Betting People series uh, with Simon Nutt. I remember listening to Andy Holdings and listening to him talk about speed figures and I thought about it in exactly the same way. And then once you start listening to something like that, then you you just learn of all these different people, even if you disagree with them or if it's not for you, you can watch something, those three-part, four-part like episodes and you learn something along the way. There's so much out there, isn't there? It segues nicely into some of the things I was going to talk about as terms of setting the groundwork for what you're going to do here if you're following tipsters or services or tools like there are some fundamentals and certainly one of them is that acknowledgement that everyone's going to be slightly different we each have access to very similar information that we oversee at the smart betting club but do things differently or our circumstances preferences are all different and understanding of that especially a certain like risk time that you have available to you, bookmaker accounts or exchange accounts you have available to you bearing in mind there's probably listeners from around the world who maybe do have less or more options when it comes to certain bookmakers or exchanges or shops and what have you. And also your the time involved. So it's no good following a tipster if they put up a bet or they put up bets at 10 a.m. every day and you're not going to be available until lunchtime. That's not really going to work if there's a you know need to get on those bets within 20 minutes. But I do find some people do sign up for products and services, even though they're not suitable for them, because they're perhaps a bit of FOMO or don't want to miss out on that. But the reality is you need to choose the services that fit into, you know, all of those circumstances that are unique to you. Yeah, you could just look at um, the information we've got on both the free tipster and the premium service pages on the SBC. We discuss all these kind of things. So talk about drawdown analysis, average odds, when you need to get bets on, whether prices are sensitive. So if you do need to get them on within 20 minutes or if they're profitable at something like Betfair starting price, um, they're all things that you've got to think about. And um, I think you mentioned risk there. Some people can take a losing run of 20 bets and they just don't mind. I think I've probably got to that point now. But when you're first starting out, that can be quite soul-destroying. So if you're yeah. like looking at a sheet, if you keep records and it's all red or if it's all zeros next to everything, that's not for everybody. Um, you've got to know yourself and uh, learn along the way what type of better you are. Yeah, and I think that's something you can learn fairly quickly. Uh, and that links in with what you said there, Pete, about fear of missing out. I, I definitely, in the early days, joined services because I've spoken to a couple of people who had some success and were getting good winners. And they'd, you know, they'd say when I speak to them, oh, you know, it's, it's amazing we had a chance to one winner. And I jumped on that service, not really being mentally, certainly not at that stage, mentally set up for backing at longer prices. So obviously the longer prices you back on average, generally speaking, the longer your, your losing runs are, are going to be. And I just wasn't set up for that at all. And I must have made that mistake two or three times before finally the message hit home that I really need to start looking for services that suited my psychology, 
and my mental capacity, et cetera. I, I, I remember one, I don't know if it's still going, I'm not sure it is, but it was a service that I, I think we used to um, we used to monitor tipping legends. Does that ring any bells? Yeah, I think it's still going in some format. Yeah. Is it? Right. Okay. Now, I remember the time, it may well have changed, I'm talking years ago now, but at, at the time that I followed, it, it really was concentrating you know, on horses, generally speaking, between 10 to 1 and, and 33 to 1. And yeah, I just wasn't ready for, for that so early on in my um, in my betting career. So this, but I only joined it because I'd heard good things about it and, and wanted a bit of the action <laughs> without thinking any further than that. Uh, so yeah, there's certainly a, a lesson there. Yeah, I, I would say it's probably one of the biggest differentials I see amongst many smart bank club members or people that come to me is that understanding of sequences and the reality of what losing can be like and how long it can be. Now, obviously, we all want to win every week or every month, but the reality isn't that linear, is it? Um, betting doesn't come in a guaranteed sum of money every month. There's some really good horse racing tips, though. Uh, like Quentin Franks is a superb racing tips to, but he bets win only at, and a fairly low strike rate. You know, he he won't think twice about having a one point win bet at thirty three to one. And the reality is, you know, you're not going to have uh, all of the such bets win all the time. They'll win more than. They should. It's a value proposition. Uh, and I find sometimes people struggle with, with tipsters, especially that have a low strike rate when they go a month or two months without maybe it's treading water, maybe making a small loss. The reality is you might get to month three and you've lost in the first two months. And what you make in that third month is, is more than what you've lost and a lot of profit on top of it. That's often what happens. But I find there are people that do give up too early during those first two months because they aren't aware of what they can lose and what size betting bank they need. And that speaks to other fundamentals that are important to set up, like a betting bank that covers drawdowns, that provides you with that cushion when a losing run hits. You think, well, I've only lost 10% of my bank and I have this money. And other things as well, we're, we're all about responsible gambling here. Absolutely, we are. And you know, one part of that is betting with money that you can afford to bet with, which isn't relevant for what you might need to pay the bills, feed your kids. This is separate money. Uh, it's a betting bank and you apply you know, a, a points unit to that bank and you know how much you're betting on all those things are sensible things a little bit boring but when your losing run hits you'll be pleased and you'll be grateful that you actually set it up on that basis because if you don't chances are you're going to give up soon when a losing run hits and you'll be questioning what the decisions you made earlier on were and why they were incorrect and what you could do differently next time and you might not have, there might not be a next time you might think you've had enough and unfortunately I do see that happen all too much so that's Another one. I think Josh as well. You're a big fan of recording all your bets. Do you, you keep very diligent records, don't you? As well, and that's another good point to to talk about. Yeah. So I keep betting banks for obviously my own betting. That's probably my biggest part. But then other services too. Um, so you can see how it's performing day by day, month by month, obviously year by year. I keep records of like the prices I took, obviously. But then I also record things like the closing price on Betfair. So then I can see. This is quite useful for someone who's quite new to it. So it's really easy to record profit and loss. It's obviously really important. But um, if you're looking to judge a service, you can also record things like what the price was when it was um, put up as a selection and what it was when it closed. And that's a really good barometer of whether a service is good or not. So over the long term, that's going to be what wins for you. Anyone can hit a lucky win, but you need someone who's going to find the value before the race goes off. Your record keeping is different. I mean, mine, Rowan, is... is bit more basic than that. I don't keep all that detail. I just do for certain strategies or tools that I'm following, keep a, a record of sorts just so I know where I'm at and if it's working for me, especially early on. Yeah, I did so. I, mean, I think my records are, are probably what a lot of people would call fairly basic and fundamental. But what I do do is separate each service or tips that I'm following. And maybe if there's more than one strategy from one source, then I would, again, sort of subcategorize. So I know exactly what strategy is is providing and what it isn't and I also something I found very useful as well actually that I learned to do and it's an obvious thing and I I don't know why I haven't thought about this a lot earlier I also record every drawdown from the highest point so if we just take units of profit as an example so start following a service I get to 10 units of profit and then I lose five then I will just note that my biggest drawdown to, to that moment is five and then obviously when it goes above the 10 point level again, I will then record the size of any drawdown from from whatever the higher figure is. So it helps when, because I think it's easy to lose faith sometimes in a tip. So you, you know, there's a, a tendency to think, oh, perhaps I just got lucky 
making a bit of profit and, and what's going on now. So if you if you've got at any moment in some sort, well, actually, you know, I, I've <laughs> previously I've, I've lost thirty five points following this strategy or this tipster. So the fact I'm I'm on a bit of a drawdown at twenty five points now, actually, that's something that I've experienced before and came back and started making more profit. Well, I just find that a really useful little parameter to to make a note of what my maximum drawdown. Yeah, it's it's very counterintuitive, isn't it? That if you're back in at average odds of say three to one. When you look at the mathematics through something like uh, Monte Carlo simulations, you start to see how long a losing run can occur, even over like a relatively small sample. So if you've had 50 bets at three to one, you can have really long losing runs and it's completely normal. Yeah, You probably still will be getting value, but you can still have those long losing runs. I, I just found it a great source of comfort during bad runs. You think, if, if you can say, well, I've had this before and worse, and I recovered, but I've made good profit since. It just psychologically, you can just say, so this this really is nothing out of the ordinary. I think sometimes it's, you, you can read it and you, and you can understand the theory, but that can be slightly different to actually seeing it in practice when it's hitting you in the pocket. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different kettle of fish. So to be able to just contextualize everything, I think is a really good thing to do if you can. Yeah, I know we're talking, we were talking about making betting for profit, but the reality is losing is part of that handling the losses, understanding the sequences, like you say, keeping records, whatever works for you, whatever gives you that peace of mind. You know, I was helping with a review that you've written today, uh, Rowan, and looking at it, and they have about a the strike rate is 16%, but the expected long losing sequence is 47. That probably yeah. surprised some people. Um, we've seen a maximum drawdown of 85 points. And again, that might surprise people, but then we look at what's realistic for uh, the Monte Carlo simulations that Josh referenced there, it was actually 99 points. There's a 1% chance of a, a 99 point drawdown. So actually 85 is well within the, the realms of what we can expect. And uh, we're not here to talk about losing money, but the reality is you are going to at different points. And if you can't handle that or you don't understand that, it's really, really easy actually to learn about it. It's not like you need to have an A-level or a degree in in uh, mathematics. You, you can find there's plenty of articles on the SPC site and articles on online as well that just give you a real basic outline of the kind of strike rates and losing runs you might come to expect. And it, it can help, especially when you're in the midst. You know, you're actually living out your skin in the game. You're losing money and you think, what do I do next? It's one thing to look at it as numbers and on a spreadsheet it's entirely something else to actually have your money being lost at the bookmaker and then to top it up again and to top it up again that sometimes is the biggest issue you have to go and That's click the deposit sometimes isn't it if yeah. They let you. yeah yeah if we just referenced horse racing so far i was just thinking as you were saying that different sports will have different risk profiles like built into them so that's right if you're looking at something like football especially if you're looking at asian handicaps or over under goals even money lines you're going to be closer to even money on your bets, most of them. Whereas if you think about a sport like golf, like we've got major this week, the average odds there are going to be way higher, even if you're back in favourites. Um, yeah. I mean, I think Scottish Sheffield's favourite this week and went off at 15 to 2. If you follow any golf tips, you're going to be looking at 50, 60, 70 to 1 average prices. So within each sport, there's going to be differences, but each sport will also have a different, a different risk profile. That's exactly right. And uh, it's golf for you if, if you struggle with losing. And, and perhaps it is more for the more experienced punter. And we'll get into that because as we go through the different stages as well. But before we get to stage one, which is the beginner stage, I should say there's basically four ways to get on. We'll get into these a little bit further on. Soft bookmakers, sharp bookmakers, which will explain the difference. Exchanges, betting exchanges like Betfair and betting shops. So the first few stages will be focused on soft bookmakers, the likes of Bet365, etc. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. And also shops. And let's get into the first one then, the stage one, which is beginners. And for me, there are two types of beginner. There's a total newbie who's perhaps placed the odd bet on the Grand National, the occasional acker on the football, maybe the Super Bowl bet. Uh, maybe they have a couple of accounts they use quite infrequently. And then there's a second type of punter, type better that they have bet extensively. They've bet a lot. They have never perhaps lost their betting accounts because, well, effectively, the bookmakers don't see them as a concern, as in they don't see them as being profitable. And I would say the best person at that to a particular juncture is the second. Somebody that's got a betting account, uh, the bookmaker has identified them, looked at them and decided, yep, we're happy to continue to take uh, your bets and uh, we, you, know, you can start to place them. And this is the ideal account to actually get started with, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Yes, if anyone wants to sell me any of those, uh, I'm, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <edit> so, <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you start to place bets, there's quite a lot of information about this. You can find it on Twitter or elsewhere online. Bookmakers profile you, so you get effectively put into like different baskets. If you're placing 
big accumulator bets or if you like you say just betting on the Grand National they're going to see you as what people normally term a, a mug punter so it's somebody who doesn't really think too much about price doesn't put too much thought into their bets they don't see you as a threat and they're going to let you bet if you create an account and then start piling in with 200 pound bets on Guatemala and second division football they're going to think well what's this what's going on with this person they know more than us we don't want their bets so yeah if you fall into that first category which a lot of people will that's a real positive because if you start to play some value bets, they'll either assume that you've been lucky or they'll think this person isn't a threat to us and they'll let you put more money down. Yeah, there is a calculation. I was reading the book Punters and there is a calculation that Paddy Power initially introduced, which basically looks at closing line value and it attributes a number. This is a more simplified version. I believe it's got more complex since then. So they can very quickly work out the value of any new account to them within like the first handful of bets that you place. So if you get beyond that and you go you know, further, there's almost like probation for new accounts and they'll start to bracket you based upon how profitable they believe you to be. And not just based on your profit and loss. That's the important thing, isn't it? It's based upon the value proposition, whether you, how you beat closing line or bet first P and other variables as well. So there are things to be aware of. If you're in that second bracket, that is ideal. And when you get this stage, there are some real simple stuff to do. Get a bunch of bookmaker accounts. That's important because you're going to start getting the best odds. You can take advantage of free bets, concessions, and uh, but uh, there's lots of other things that you, happen when you open accounts. You might get some bonuses, etc., as well. And this stage is very much if you're a total beginner and you're into the world of following tips. This is about just seeing how it works for you. You've, both of you have talked, especially you, Rowan, about making some decisions about services that didn't fit into your circumstances. Or, you know, Josh, you mentioned about risk, and that's important. So this stage, it's go and choose some free or very affordable services and just see what you like. Can you bet on certain sports or markets? Do you have the time available? And do you like betting on them? Do you like betting on golf? You know, do you like betting on tennis? Do you like betting on certain sports? Don't stake too much because you're just trying to learn about how this world works and also find out what suits you. And perhaps if you've been betting for a while and not made a profit, it might be about unraveling some bad practices or bad habits that you might have developed or, you know, the idea that I see some people put up, you can't make a profit betting odds on or, you know, you should only bet each way or whatever. People have these different theories, don't they, guys, that sometimes cost them a fair bit because, well, the, there's no hard and fast rules all the time when it comes to how you can make a profit. I think this stage actually is... is a really exciting stage to be at because you've got the whole sort of betting landscape ahead of you. You can just plot your own course through it. And there are so many options out there now that you can use to, to make a profit from the bookmakers. It, it's a tremendously exciting time. And I think that just going back a, a couple of things you said there, Pete, you know, the use of the, the concessions, the free bets that you get when you sign up, all these, obviously these soft books competing for business, initial business, you can build up a fairly decent betting bank without taking any risk whatsoever by using those free bets and, and concessions that you often get and, and are thrown at you. And then when it comes to starting your actual betting, straight betting, following tips and services, this is the time I think where it's really important just to keep your stakes very, pretty small because if you, hopefully you won't, but if you do make a mistake, whether it be in terms of the sort of service that you're, you've signed up to or you're following, then it's better to not lose so much money whilst you make that mistake. I think one of the biggest things that people can realize, the most important things that people can realize when they're at this stage is that it's very, very easy just to ramp things up as you go along. You don't have to jump in with two feet staking as much as you possibly can at this stage. It's all about getting a feel for things, making sure that what it is that you're, you're subscribed to and you're following really suits you in a way that minimizes the amount of money you might lose if it doesn't, uh, if that makes sense, if I've explained that the right way. So yeah, I think it's just a really exciting time for any sort of any punter who, who wants to make a long-term profit. I think it's a brilliant time to be. Yeah, I think most people will find this as they move along. Staking is something that's really tricky for anyone who's betting. So I imagine like hardcore professional bettors struggle with it too. The temptation is always to bet more than you should have, in my experience. Yeah. Um, that's where betting banks really come into play. So if you've set aside, say, a thousand pounds for a service and it's 200 point bank, you stick to that five pound stake. It's really important to do that. It's good to have that discipline. And the other benefit of staking at a lower level when you first start out, 
with these new bookmakers is you're not going to set any alarms, alarm bells off if you're betting £5 each way. If you go steaming in with £50 each way on horses, say, or big bets on the golf, that profiling is going to come back and they're going to look at you again. So keeping stakes low is really good advice um, when you're first starting out. It definitely is. Do you think that it's a good idea as well, perhaps just to put some mug bets on um, when you when you get a new account, you open your accounts, you know, you, whether it be the sort of the your odds or the, you know, the sort of the multis that you, you make up that are typical of what the bookmakers perceive to be a, a mug pun. So just to, as, a, alongside you, you know, the bets that you're getting from your services that are providing you the value, because I, I, I think from personal experience, I think it genuinely can make a huge difference in terms of the longevity of that account as you get more experience and you do start staking more, if at the beginning is that probably when they're really most closely watching you to profile you, as we've just said, you come across as being somebody who likes a, uh, you know, a bet on a, an odds on treble at half time in the Sunday afternoon match on Sky or something. Do, do, do you think there's, it's worth doing that? Definitely. We've been talking about it recently, Peter, and we've given some yes. advice about um, betting in play on short price favourites, maybe doubling them up. Um, you could also go into, say, the casino and have a tenner on red or black because your expected value there is basically even. Um, obviously, it's a little bit against you, uh, 2 or 3%. But it lo- makes you look like you're a recreational better. It makes you look like you're just playing and you see it as entertainment like they want you to. Anything that makes you look like you're not betting shrewdly is, um, is a good idea. Yeah, and with uh, bookmakers, they'll often throw free spins at you from the casino. Worth doing them. You mentioned real life. Blackjack's another one if you can use the original blackjack strategy. Uh, that's a really good one in terms of return to player of way of like, you know, they'll see some history of playing some casino games, even if it is blackjack. And they might assume that uh, in terms of the profile and your type of customer they want. But what I would say is that it varies bookmaker to bookmaker. If you're going to try a Canby bookmaker, can be a sports book operator. I think you're not going to get very far at all, even if you have been You've got a long-term account that's lost money. Some of the more bigger firms are so hot on this. I would include like Paddy Power Betfair with that as well. And so just be mindful of the fact it isn't ever going to work for every bookmaker. It will for some, and but it's not an exact science, is it? You just don't know, you know, if you open new accounts with this goal, how much you have to bet and are you ever through probation? Are you just one winning shrewd bet away from being limited? Sometimes you are, but it's worth trying, certainly, and building up experience on, on what to do and what not to. And the other thing I would say as well, kind of in line with this, is avoid tips just putting out bets in really weak markets. So an example of this would be overnight racing markets. Bet365 will price up a racing meeting the day before, maybe about 5 p.m. the day before. And they're effectively using that overnight racing market to take very small sums of money to work out their prices for them. The shrewd punters or some shrewd punters or tipsters will put up a bet at 20 to 1 and knowing it should be 10. And the bet 365 will take the 20 pounds that people are allowed on and then make it 10 to 1. What will happen to those bets that people placing that bet at 20 to 1, they'll be identified. And that's the type of thing that's going to cause you your account. It's not worth doing it at any stage, really, I feel. Uh, even later on when we will talk about really hammering accounts. So try and avoid those tipsters that put up bets early into really weak markets. Golf's the same, you know, some tipsters put up bets early on a Monday into like the DP World Tour. Now, there's some good ones that do that, but yeah, you just want to be careful because they quickly become ARBs and, you know, it's easy for the trader or compiler to know who you're following and and why you've placed that particular bet. Um, so there are little things to be aware of at, early, at an early stage to be aware of. Certainly, um, you might want to do some of this more sharp, sharp practice later on when you're not too bothered about your account, you're more bothered about making money quickly. Uh, and that's that probably moves us on quite nicely to builders, which is our stage two. So you've got all your accounts, you've got a sense of what you like to do, what you like to follow, got started with some profitable betting and now you want to expand it. Uh, And this is an important stage because this is going to provide you the platform for future success and uh, you want to diversify a little bit. You probably want to avoid just all following one particular sport or one particular betting market. Uh, What advice would you have from your own experience, guys, at this stage in terms of how to move forward into into the, the next phase of your betting? This might sound a little bit boring, but I almost think of it as like a business plan. So I think you mentioned there, don't follow all services that kind of concentrate on one thing. There's no point in having five tipsters that all specialise on flat horse racing, for example. So you want to be thinking about diversifying into different sports, especially. And then also it might be different codes of racing. That would be an example. 
I think at this stage, you'd, again, you don't need to be spending lots of money on tipsters or anything like that, but you want to be thinking about those different sources. That would be the key for me. Um, we have lots in the Hall of Fame where we've got really detailed information about what this tipster specialises in and what their historical records are. Um, so I'd be looking there. That's where you can find dozens and dozens of services that will give you that nice mix, um, match up to how you want to bet. Yeah, I think I'd add to that. I, mean, I think those are two very, very valid points. I think diversification is a, a fundamental principle of any form of um, investment, isn't it? And betting should be no difference in that respect. And also the cost. I don't think your stakes are likely at this stage to be as big as they might become as you continue with your journey. And therefore, it's possibly better to follow tips and services because there are plenty of good ones out there that are either free to follow or the subscription costs are, are very modest. There's no point, I don't think, in subscribing at this stage to what may be a very, very good service, but is also very, very expensive. And we, we reviewed one that it was published a little earlier this this month, wasn't it, Pete? Where Yeah, Sys Analyst. Well, we might as well let's talk about them. It's the one of your yeah, yeah one of your bet right. Yes, the Sys Analyst. An amazing service and has been for a number of years, but you you need at least a ten thousand pound bank to make the most of it. And that's a fact. And I don't think possibly at this stage many will be at that point. Um, not if you're diversifying, as we say we we ought to be doing and, and following uh, a good number of tipsters. So those are the two, obviously, two very obvious points. And I think the other thing to learn as well is that wherever possible, you do diversify where it is you place your bets amongst the soft accounts that you've got still open to you. I used to, something I used to do when I had those accounts on a week by week basis, if I had a, a, I'd keep a running tally of how many bets I'd placed with that bookmaker. So if there were three bookmakers offering the best price and I'd already had five bets with one, four bets with the other, but only two bets with, with the other, then I would go with a bookmaker I've got. So I only had two bets with just to try and even it out as much as possible and spread the, the stakes and, and the betting as much as possible because, again, help you, your accounts last that, that much longer. We did mention early on about getting as many bookmaker accounts as you can. Obviously, there's the famous ones like your bet 365s, Paddy Power, Skybet, William Hill. We've done lots of work this year at the SPC around independent bookmakers and also lesser known bookmakers that offer very similar markets, uh, very similar concessions and whatnot but maybe you wouldn't have heard of before. So both of those are profiled quite heavily on the website. Um, so you can find lots of different options. Um, so you don't have to concentrate your bets on three or four accounts. You can spread them out around 12 or 13. That'll make all of them last longer, which is what you're aiming for at this point, I think. Probably there's a limit, isn't there, to how much you can spread around, how much money you have to open accounts yeah. and have money in different accounts. But, you know, it's probably better to rather, if you, if you get to the stage where you want to put a £50 bet on a, on a horse, you might want to put five, ten pounds with different firms, uh, rather than having 50 on one, spreading it around, especially if you're not really taking like really early warm prices and, and things like that, just to make sure you, you know, you've got some activity in there. Mix it up as well as we talked about, spread those bookmakers and that because this stage is really setting getting ready to start to go to stage three, which is the banker stage. And this is a stage where you're going to ramp it up as hard as you can. And let's move on to that because this is when you're really going to start trying to make some serious profit. Stages one and two, you've built the foundations, you've understood what you're doing, you know which sports markets suit you, you know how they work, so you know how the golf market works, you know how the racing market works, you know how all the terminologies that are in play, you know how bets get settled, or what happens if your golfer is tied for a place return, all these different facets of that only really you understand once you start to get into it. And now you're ready, you understand and you're ready to go. And this is when you're really going to start making some profit, but also suffering from restriction. So having all of these different bookmakers, because there's a lot more than just the odds checker bunch, isn't there? There's, like you say, we've done a fair bit of work, but we still haven't scratched the surface. If you go online and search how many bookmakers there are in the UK alone, there's countless ones that you've not heard of. And of course, some are better than others, but not all of them are as sharp or going to be as quick to, to limit you as Paddy Power might do. And so there are uh, lots of options there. And um, yeah, at this point as well, I think it's worth differentiating between what a soft and sharp bookmaker is because soft bookmakers are the ones that restrict you on. Do you, either of you want to explain about soft bookmakers or sharp bookmakers? So a soft bookmaker will be one that will take your bets, um, but if you're successful, they're more likely to just close you down. Whereas a sharp bookmaker, instead of doing that, they'll do what bookmakers traditionally did. If they get a lot of money for selection, they'll change their prices and they'll just adjust their book. So in this country, we don't really have many 
major sharp bookmakers. You will get that from your smaller independents. Um, they won't offer you lots of concessions, but they will take your bets and then they'll adjust their prices. Um, for those who know a little bit about gambling, probably the most famous one, correct me if I'm wrong, would probably be Pinnacle yep. on a global level. So they'll take money off every, anybody and they won't restrict any better, but then they'll adjust their prices. So that's the difference really. Soft bookmakers will restrict you. They're not as sharp as sharp bookmakers, obviously. They'll restrict people who win, whereas the sharp bookmakers will continue to take money from people. Yeah, the, sh- the sharp bookmakers effectively are using the information to sharpen their lines and their prices. So syndicates will bet with them. Tony Bloom, Starless, and starts to bet on Spanish football with Pinnacle. They will acknowledge that and adjust their prices subsequently. So therefore, that's taking that information and using it. And they're very much a, a high volume, low margin approach where they want custom. So you won't get banned by Pinnacle or Circus Sports or some of the betting brokers, or especially Asian firms. They're often based out in Asia. That's why sometimes they're called Asian firms that want that volume because they're making that their money from it. Whereas the soft bookmakers don't really care. They know that they're easily beatable if you're betting each way with them on racing or golf or certain markets. They know they're vulnerable, but they don't care because they filter you as a customer and include or exclude you. And that's how they make their profits rather than you know knowing that this bet shouldn't be 2.0, it should be 1.8. They're like, well, we'll hang it at 2.0 and we'll just close those people down who, who we evaluate as taking that bet because they're shrewd versus those people who take it because they just got lucky. <laughs> yeah. There's also betting exchanges as well, which is important to touch on. So that's another option. So betting exchanges work in a similar basis effectively, but they take a commission on a winning. So you're a backer or a layer, you'll pay whether your bet wins. So they, again, welcome volume in theory. That's a whole different topic of what Betfair are doing at the moment. So they welcome winners. Uh, And the fourth option, Rowan, you'll be able to speak to is betting shops because you do that extensively as well. Very often, there's clustering of shops in poorer areas. And there's several in the UK and Ireland, wherever you are around the world, different jurisdictions, you might have shops available to you. And I think the thing to say about bookmaker shops is, uh, as well, it's, you know, you can get on if you're limited by Betfred to close your account, you can still go into a Betfred shop uh, and place a bet with them and, and get on. Yeah, right? definitely. I, mean, I bet for a, on, online closed my uh, account years ago and they were particularly quick to do so. But I would literally say now that Oh, oh gosh, I, I haven't got the exact figures, but I would suggest that 75 to 80% of all my betting now is done through Betfred. <laughs> so uh-huh. but the other difference is, is that I'm, I'm going in and, and using cash, making friends with the people that work in there so they, they don't uh, sort of groan when you come in. So when you have a big win, they're not tempted to, I mean, it's not their decision ultimately, but it's not their decision. They, they don't want to be seeing you off. So yeah, it's a completely different experience. It's, it's a different type of way of betting I've, I've found but one that can be very profitable so yes when you get to that stage it's certainly a, a very realistic option for anybody yeah so at this stage you're going to be hitting your accounts you've worked out the services and strategies and tips just to follow you know that make a profit how to use them and you're going to be hitting them as hard as you can within obviously affordability not for well affordability certainly what you can deposit but within the framework of being a, a sensible gambler you know you're working to betting banks and you're not betting money that you can't afford and you're not going on tilt. And you are going to suffer account restrictions, but you have the options of using all these different soft bookmakers. There's so many more than just the Bet365 and the Checker group of bookmakers out there. And you can really make some serious money at this particular point. It's probably going to be the best stage and the easiest money you're going to make when you're betting is when you're with these uh, bookmakers, the soft bookmakers. And uh, this stage might last a short period of time. It might last a long period of time. I know we're not really going to get into multi-accounting, but obviously a lot of people do that, whereby they bet in their partner's name, their uncle's name, their auntie's name, whoever it might be, enable them to get down. But I would say at this stage as well, guys, you, you're building that easier money, if you like, and building your bankroll to enable you to bet into stage four and five, which is getting into the exchanges, to the sharp bookmakers, to the shops. What was your transition like? Because I know you do shops predominantly now, Roman, as you say. Josh, you do a lot in exchanges. What was your transition like at at this stage? Because I find that some people get, they can't move past this stage. They just think, well, if I'm closed by the bookmaker or this particular firm, I'm done. I'm going to give up. When the the reality is they then need to go, right, this is the game. And now I'm going to move on to the next stage, which is a little trickier at times, but still can be rewarding if you know you know, if you have experience of what can work for you and how to actually start to make a, take advantage of it. Yeah, I, I think it's like any business. I think, you know, you have to adapt. 
and you've got to be open minds to doing things differently and not say, well, this is the way I've always done it and that's worked for me, so now I can't do it that way, I'll, I'll give up. If you do that, there's no hope, really. <laughs> and I think this also has an impact, direct impact. There are, there are services, tipsters and, and other services that you can use as your source of betting you just have to accept you've got to go and do a, go about it in a different way. I think Josh used, I mean, I do use exchanges. I use them now for, for golf and I've adapted my own personal strategy for how I bet on golf because I'm restricted to an extensively exchanges. Let's give you an example. So there's a, a service that I use, Bookie Bashing, which has an exceptionally good record on, on golf using their, their model. Now, that model is, its aim is to find value in extra places that a lot of the soft books um, offer on weekly tournaments. On the exchanges, you're not quite able, generally speaking, to, to get as good price on, on the places. But what I have found is that you get better prices on the win elements of an each way bet. So what I do now is I look to place win bets on the exchange that this week, for example, at the US Open, there was plenty of value at my local bet, Fred and Ladbrokes, where I can get use the extra places. So I've just decided, right, okay, so I've, these are the golfers I want to back. I'm going to back these ones, win only on the exchanges because the win prices are so good and representing value. And I'm also going to go out and put some cash down on, on each way bets to take advantage of the value in the place part of the bet as well. So it's just about finding different ways to go about making your profit. But those ways are very, very much out there. So if you give up before you get to that point, well, you're missing out on an awful lot in my opinion. Yeah. And there's going to be a blend, isn't there, Josh? You, you know, you're probably the same. There's going to be a blend. You're not going to be all stage three, all stage four, all stage five. You're going to be a blend. You might have a bunch of stuff you do, which is soft, which is shops, which is exchanges. And like Rowan says, just once you understand the market and you understand the pros and cons of where you can bet and the disadvantages and advantages of each place, you then you understand like where to take the value, where you can get on and how you can find the, the best approach. And, and it, that's why it takes a little bit more time and attention and experience, doesn't it, Josh, to kind of know where to hit and when? Yeah, so uh, Rowan said adaptability, that's the key. I struggled with it when I transitioned from using bookmakers for most of my bets to using exchanges. So to give one practical example, if you're betting each round horses, let's say, if you back a horse at six to one with the bookmakers and it places, you're going to get 10% return on your money. You won't get that on the exchange. So in general, you'll get a much better win price, very much like the golf, but you won't get the place return. So when you come up with that and you, you see that's how it works, you have to think to yourself, well, am I going to stop using service or stop betting that way? Or am I going to go win only and accept longer losing runs? My general outlook has been, as I've progressed further and further is, I want to get more money down, so I want to increase my turnover by quite a lot, but I'll accept a lower return on investment. I might make the same amount of money for a year, but that will be from placing a, a heck of a lot more staking, like turning my money over a lot more. That's what I've learned along the way. But yeah, the transition's tricky. You've got to look at the services that you're using, you, uh, read the SBC reports, look at um, returns at, on exchanges compared to bookmakers and see if it still works, because some won't, and that's fine. But um, you've got to kind of do um, an audit almost to see what works and what doesn't. That's right. You know, we, you referenced earlier, Rowan, Sys Analyst, one of the recent reviews. That's a really good example. One of several that we've got in our betting exchange and sharp bookmaker tips this section. And they put forward, you know, this is the minimum price. And they base their results on fair average odds uh, from the exchange. And there's a little bit of work involved, if you like, to make sure you get that value price and to get matched at that. You just don't take Betfair SP because very often there's better prices and understanding what a value price actually is, is important rather than Betfair SP, which is you don't know until the race actually starts. That's the type of thing you need to know and those services that you can follow and utilize. So your ROI might be a bit lower, as Josh says, but, and also you need to put more time and attention and understanding into the market when to take your bet because you're not going to get best odds guaranteed, which covers you from, you know, if the horse drifts. So you're not going to get eight places each way if you're only betting in win and top five on the golf. You're not getting these concessions either. So it's a bit more time, a bit more attention. And it can be tricky because it's not the low-hanging fruit that you're going to get earlier on. But it is scalable. It is something that you can then use to build further. And that would take us through to stage five, which is basically building on this. You're probably not going to have, this is for big bankroll players. You're going to have a considerable bank. 
And you're going to be looking to use this mainly with exchanges and shop bookmakers and also shops. Eventually, even shops are going to kick you out. They have CCTV. They you know, allegedly share information on players or winning betters through instant messenger apps. That's the allegation. But certainly, if you continue go to, to go to the same Betfred shop and getting paid out, they're going to remember you and you're going to get banned and you're going to get banned. So it does happen. And people obviously employ runners just as they do multi accounters But ultimately, you are going to end up probably focusing on betting into sharp bookmakers and brokers. It's where, and it's worth a word here because people often, I've had a few emails from people asking about betting brokers and how you can bet with Pinnacle because Pinnacle, they're not available in the UK. They left, I think, 2014, but they are in existence and there's lots of ways you can get on. Now, there are brokers out there that might facilitate you depending on where you live. It's worth checking out. It's a gray area. I can't go and recommend you do X or Y because it really depends on where you live and your uh, attitude to risk. But there are options and availability out there. I'd also say as well, you'll find Pinnacle's market for several sports and markets is replicated on the exchanges. So I know, for example, the NBA is a very popular betting market. I think Matchbook have a really good liquid market on that and you'll find that is replicated across like football markets as well so whatever pinnacles offering you might find on popular sports that will be replicated on exchanges so there are options available to you if you're not able to use some of those sharp bookmaker firms but this stage five it's very much about volume isn't it you're probably going to get a low return on investment and uh, at this stage you you know you, you you've got it made haven't you you've got a scalable uh, set up and you've got the experience and you know how to make a profit and you're doing quite well. The, probably the biggest issues are things like the premium charge, which uh, affects you a bit or moving money around is the other option as well, isn't it, these days with uh, affordability limits as well. Yeah, I was um, as you were talking then, I was thinking about the different services that we host that would be applicable to this stage. So you're looking for, like you said, Pete, it might be lower ROI, but things that are scalable, things where you're going to place quite big stakes. Um, we've got a couple of football services that have joined as premium services this year. Their average ROI is really low, but they're betting closer to even money. You're probably going to stake quite highly. And then Rowan mentioned bookie bashing. They've got so many tools on their site. You're looking for things where you can get the true odds of something and you might be able to go and find on exchange a 3 or 4% edge and then bet at volume. So lots of bets down, even if it's just a really small edge. It's not just volume either, is it? It's, you know, when, we've, when we're reaching this stage, it's the amount you're staking. And what Josh just said there is, is absolutely spot on. You, you tend then to be drawn towards services that A, can give you a lot of bets potentially, or can give you a, a guide in terms of what is value and what isn't. So that when you're looking at the exchanges, you can monitor the exchanges and wait for the price to, to get to the point where you, you need a sys analyst, for example. We've mentioned that there's something I do. They give them a minimum advisable price to take on the exchanges and you've got the choice then, well, okay, well, do I take it as soon as it's available or do I wait until just before the race starts when there's more money in the market so you're possibly more likely to get that, um, that price? Yeah, and, and then when you're going into the shops, you, you know you've got... <laughs> The way I put it is you trust the maths. It's not a, a tipster as such, but somebody who's providing you with information based on a really good assessment and calculation of, of win probabilities. And you know, therefore, that, okay, I'm going to put this much on at this price. And if I keep doing that time and time and time again, I'm going to make money. And that's how it works. You just trust the maths behind the process. So yeah, that's the only thing I'd, I'd add to that. Yeah, it probably is you're following less tipsters and using more some of the tools and algorithms that are out there to provide value to you to actually guess on because... There are some, obviously, tips that will work with it, but uh, once you start betting at scale, you want to get volume on, you'll want to use some of those tools to enable you to, to get as much as possible, to get as many bets as possible on, and that will help you. Some of those tools will certainly uh, help you to do that. Something that I've been using as well to, to do that myself. Uh, and the other thing I would say is, you know, it depends upon your, sometimes you have to put more work in it at these stage four and five, but it depends on what your hourly rate looks like. You know, sometimes I drill it down into that. So there's certain things that I do on golf where, you know, it takes a few hours perhaps per tournament, but I know because I log my results, what my performance is and effectively what my hourly rate is. And I look at that and go, well, it's worth that time because 
I can see the rewards from that. So uh, those are things that I start to think about at the, these stages, you know, what is going to provide me the biggest bank for my book and for my time, you know? So that's something as well to, to consider. So, well, I think that's all five stages covered there, stages one through five. And I think the important point is to say, everyone is, like, say, everyone's going to be at a different stage. It might be a blend of different stages as well, depending upon where you're at. And, uh, you know, it's very much a journey. So there's no right or wrong, whether you're starting at stage one or stage five. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about some of the specific services that we, you've referenced a few, Rowan and, and, and Josh, we, we've talked about a few today, but there are a lot more. And we'll be able getting into that in the separate uh, members podcast that will go out dedicated to those. Uh, so if you're interested in that, but in the interim as well, there's probably a few more links that we can share. Rowan, your bet diary. Now that is basically this in a nutshell, isn't it? It's about what you follow and the returns and the profit and losses that you encounter on. Do you want to outline what that is? Yeah, it's just uh, the, the aim of that is to give a, a regular, and it comes up twice a week on Mondays and Wednesdays, and it's um, it's not usually uh, particularly long, but it's just aimed at observations and, and things that you learn along the way of a, of a betting journey and the, the challenges that you may face and, and the way you think around potential issues, uh, sort of thing we've just been, been talking about, uh, but also just uh, like a following a, a profit and loss so you can see, hopefully you'll see readers, uh, readers will be able to see that you know, it's not always plain sailing. You, you go through the downs as, as well as the ups, but ultimately, over the long term, um, if you stick doing the right things, then you'll you'll make a good level of profit. So it, it's just a following the journey as it as it happens. How's your um, new runner working out, Rowan? Yeah, he's a lazy. Uh, I was going to use a different word then. <laughs> <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose you should be over eighteen if uh, if listeners this. Of course, I, I shouldn't hold for. So for anybody who doesn't know, it, it, it happens to be my son, who's um, a tax dodging student. Uh, but one who, uh, when he's not at home, uh, he lives uh, 200 and odd miles away, but where he is, he can literally roll out of bed and almost into one paddy power and two bet threads. <laughs> it's quite, uh, it seemed a resource that was too good to uh, turn down. Uh, so yeah, he's doing all right. He's, he's learning the ropes, which is good. <laughs> I'll feed him at Christmas, put it that way. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, that, yeah, because that speaks to go using your betting uh, in shops, doesn't it, as well? And that, different ways and means to get on. And sometimes it is a bit of, uh, like that. It's about finding solutions to problems. If you're blocked off by one betting account, uh, you can use other bookmakers and you can start to transition, as we've talked about as well. So we have all that. So obviously the bet diaries on site, you'll be able to find that. I would also point people in the direction of some of the free tips that we have, which are ideal for the early stages. Um, sometimes you know, there's a few that we've had in the past that are no longer free, but they made a good profit for several years. Uh, and you'll often find there's a, quite a few at the moment that are good. Uh, simple to follow as well, like a couple of Betfair SP racing tipsters. So there's some interesting stuff there to follow. And like I say, if, if, also, if people want to know more, we'll have the second podcast and obviously the Smart Betting Club website's there if you're interested in this particular concept. Because we do this ourselves, each of us, you know, has skin in the game and we follow many of these tips as tools and strategies ourselves. And uh, it, like I say, it provides a, a pretty nice income for, for each of us. So hopefully you've enjoyed listening to our experience today and what we've been able to share. Uh, my thanks to both of you, Rowan and Josh. Is there anything that you want to sign off with? Any advice or if you could pick out, let's go with one top tip for anybody interested in basically trying to make a, a profit from their betting, what would you, what would you advise them? Take your time would be mine. You've got all the time in the world. You can ramp up. We've just talked about the whole podcast. I've been talking about how you get in right at the very beginning, possibly with either no or very little knowledge, and you can build it up to generating a really good second income or even some do primary income. As long as you just take it step by step, learn along the way, keep your discipline, you'll get there. Good stuff. And Josh? Yeah, I'd echo that. I'd also say find out what type of better you are. So everybody's going to be different. Some people like the risk. Uh, they don't mind betting at long odds. They don't mind long losing runs, whereas that just won't suit some people. So try and work out what type of bet you are. That will help as you go along. I think we're calling it a journey, aren't we? Yeah, as you go along your journey. Some good stuff there. Take your time. Like I, I always say, make your mistakes at small stakes. Be patient, discipline, and learn about your risks. Some really good stuff to end the podcast. Thanks very much, gents. And if anyone has any questions from the recording of this podcast about any of the things we've talked about, you can always get in touch. My email is pete at smartbettingclub.com. You can find us on Twitter as well, at SBC Info. That's all for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I'll speak to you soon.